Welcome to the Hidden Bookcase. Come through and get cozy. Pick a book, your favorite book. That's the one that opens this room. Inside, you'll find a warm fire, a loving cat, and a wide skylight to the stars. And a dangerously high to be red pile. I'm Morgan. I use they, them pronouns, and I am a youth crowned in black flying through the skies. I'm Soren. I use he, him pronouns, and I am a cat named Cat. We've been friends for over a decade and are always swapping books. Each fortnight, we take it in turns to recommend one another a favorite read. The first time reader tells us what they know about the book, makes some predictions about what they don't, and then we discuss our thoughts with all of you bookworms. So today, let's get to talking about... Hooky by Miriam Bonastro Tour. Soren. Here we are, final episode of the year. Yes. Oh my gosh. And what a book to pick. What a book to end on. Tell me about Hooky. I am unprepared to summarise Hooky, so I'm going to tell you guys how I found out about it first, which is a very simple story. I was in my local bookshop. I was not having a good day. I was standing in the graphic novel aisle. I saw something with a cute spine. I pulled it out. I was charmed by the colourful art and soft vibes and cute character designs. So I bought this book. (laughs) I don't remember why I was having a bad day, but I was having a bad day. So I was like, I can justify buying a slightly expensive graphic novel. What is Hookie about? Hookie is about a pair of twins who are witches and they miss the bus to magic school. They miss the teleporting bus. They can't catch up with it. Basically decide to play hooky for the whole year. So they bounce around. They stay with an aunt for a little while. And eventually they end up with this mysterious wizard fellow who lives in a tower and fall into his life. And they make some friends. And there's large plot machinations happening mixed with slice of life magical shenanigans. And that's hooky. It's my bread and butter. <laughs> Exactly what I want. Exactly. I'm just gonna say, literally, this book, I literally was like, I was like reading it and it was chill. And then like last night I was like, oh, I actually have to re- I have to finish it. And I was like, mm. this essay I have to do, so I'm just gonna sit down, and I'm gonna finish it. And I was like less than halfway through the book. And then I finished the book and I was making sounds. My <laughs> flatmate came over to check on me, and I literally turned around to her and I was like, I think this is my favorite book of the year. Because like the second half mm-hmm. was just like beat after beat was just like morgan's gonna love this morgan's gonna love this morgan's gonna love this like every it was like written for me that's kind of what i felt reading it as well which is why i had to pick it and i also had a similar thing where i was reading it like after work i think it was like a a week where i would picked up loads of extra shifts and i was having like nine hours a day and i was just coming home and i was reading like one chapter and then falling asleep so it took me ages and then when i hit the second half i was exhausted and i still stayed up really late there's just something in the second half it's addictive imploded my brain and gave me energy and i was just like i checked online to see if my store had a copy of volume two and i went into work early and i found that volume and i bought it before work i put down this book and i was like no but i need to read volume two like now like i need to read it now (laughs) uh yeah i don't want to get too into it before you've done the blind but i let's do the blind let's do the blind so that we can screw The more I do Blind Reacts, the more I'm learning that I'm really good at forgetting everything I know about a book. Um, But here we are with Hooky. Um, It's very pretty. It's very cute. Um, I think anything I possibly know about it is linked in my brain with uh, My Hero Academia, Little Witch Academia, and Witch Hat Atelier. They're all the same thing in my brain. And I know they're not but they are. Having said that, I know literally nothing about this book. I don't know what it's about. I know there's a witch on the front cover. She's got a really cute cat. It looks very vibey. Um, I know Soren's read it. I know my friend India has read it. I've heard only good things. Um, yeah, that's it. So can't wait to read it. No, you're just ignoring Dorian's existence on the cover. <laughs> I am a very specific man. I have my specific tastes. And you're a it feminist. Is magical women, magical girls. The priorities are there, okay? It's on brand to just ignore his existence, to be fair, I feel like. so. <laughs> also, I feel like I should say, I have not read or watched or know anything about any of the three anime slash manga that I just listed in my blind, they were all the same soup in my brain. Yeah. They occupied the same dimension. But here we are. And this one doesn't actually have a magical school because they never make it. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I guess there is one. Categorically, it does exist. As far as we know. As far as we know. This would have been their first year because they talk about making friends. Yeah. They don't seem to know what happens in a magic school. They're like, yes, we made friends. 
that's what we're going to write in our letter. <laughs> I think it's like a secondary school vibe because they're like 12. So yeah, and presumably they were homeschooled up to this point, which kind of explains the everything about them. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Okay. Are we talking about the cover? Yeah. It's very pretty. Pretty. It's like pastels, but also bright at the same time. The wrap around, getting to see everybody on the back. I love that. Yeah. Everyone's just having such a little wholesome time. It looks like nothing bad could ever happen to anybody. They're all just yeah. eating tea and raisin pudding. On the outside, this looks so chill. Right? And so, like, calm. <laughs> and then you get in there and it's like, what if this was a whole narrative about being hunted and learning to accept who you are and going off the fucking rails? But also, they're 12. But also, they're 12. In a really interesting balance, because I remember when I was like, oh yeah, let's do this again, and then rereading it. I only read it like a few months ago. But in my brain, I was like, oh yeah, it starts out pretty relaxed, and then it slowly introduces you to the horrors, and then I reread it, and I was like, hang on, there's like kidnapping and prisons in like 20 pages. They're literally complicit in multiple crimes by like page 12. <laughs> They're complicit in an abduction on page 17. Love that for them. So... Not really, actually. <laughs> but then things just sort of brighten up for a bit. Everything's fine for a while. Mm -hmm. It's all chill. It's slice of life. They're just, they're doing things. They get a beach episode. We get a beach episode. This would make such a good cartoon. It would, honestly. Someone animate it, please. Oh my I god. I would die for you. It would be so fun. Okay, tell me what you wanted to say before we listen to your blind. I don't know, man. You know me. I do. The listeners are beginning to learn to know me. Aren't you tired of being nice? Tick. Cute magical princess with like manic pixie dream girl vibes, going a bit goth, and also being like, everything is possible through the power of friendship and anime. Amazing. The bit that really, really like got me was the aren't you tired of being nice moment. Yeah. The, yeah. Just, I love it when a protagonist breaks and becomes like really OP. Exactly. It's beautiful. And there are kind of several of them here, which is great. Both of them are sort of having a villain arc because we need to have that which one of them is going to be the Witch King, and then they throw Damien in there. Yeah. The aesthetics of Damien. The aesthetics of Damien. He does indeed have white hair and trauma. <laughs> <laughs> He's even homosexual. I'm pretty confident. We oh only God, see him yeah. rejecting Will's advances here, but like they're in love. We oh know they're God. in love. It's so Merlin and Arthur coded. Mm. Oh my God. It's beautiful. The way he like walks past them and he like sees them and then blocks it off so that he's like, yeah, I didn't see anybody, even though yeah. I'm supposed to be the evil witch king. And I'm literally only doing this because you've got my boyfriend. Love that for him. He's trying his best. Oh my God. There's just so many things. Also, I need to like gush about the rereading experience. I was kind of almost like, I don't really want to reread this again. I've got so many other things to read at the moment. Like I had a great time, but how much am I going to get out of a reread? And I was so wrong because I got so much out of a reread because I forgot how many like little twists there are and how much foreshadowing there is in this. And it was just driving me insane. Like the fact that um, Master Pendragon is like, after he reveals his whole, I was going to murder you kids. And then I thought, maybe I'll train you as apprentices instead. And he's like, I tried to recruit you with advertisements. At the beginning of this book, there's all these little stupid <laughs> advertisements on him in the background, which I obviously completely missed on my first read. <laughs> like, there's one in the jail for some reason. <laughs> Just a poster <laughs> of his face. Dead expression being like, I'm looking for apprentices. What is the beautiful incredible it's so good. Words. and there's little mentions of damien as well like there's a bit where they're discussing like the twins are having this conversation about their parents and getting in trouble with their parents and they're like oh mm. and also and then they're like no no let's not talk about him yeah the good soup amazing you can yeah. tell this is plotted very very carefully it's just it's so good and you have like the characters are all so well-rounded Mm. And are like having their whole interior lives. Nico at the beginning when he's like, "Yeah, I hate Mark. Let's go bully Mark. He's my yeah. bully." And then you find out that they're literally like best friends and they live together, practically brothers. And he's just having a moment where he's like, "Ugh, Mark." And then he gets this whole segue where he just goes on about his like trauma, and it's like, "Sir, I would die for you." Honestly, it's like, oh, he's just like the little character to bounce off of, and then it's like, nope, he's got all this going on. Yeah, has, he has a tragic backstory of his own. Yeah. yeah. The magic system is just cool. Like, it's soft, but it's also, like, it's beautiful. Mm. Especially with how Danny's powers work. I'm just, like, we've only got hints of it in Volume 1, and I'm like, this is perfect. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of um, Galadriel from The I Skull was going to say. 
Like, yeah, I just try to clean my room, but I accidentally have this spell that slaughters millions. Whoops. Conveniently for her, she's in like a PG-13 novel, so she's only killed animals so far. <laughs> like, so far. So far. Yeah. When she started just floating and she didn't even have a wand and she was still mm. doing stuff because she was so angry. She was like, you've killed the nice witches. I'm the only one f***ing left. I'm going to swear a lot in this episode, but here we are. Honestly, killing Alex as well. Narrative power move, because I never expected it. It kind of stuck up on me even the second time reading it. I was like, I forgot that this just happened so suddenly and horrifically. It's like, you're going to kill off the queer mentor character? Really? Brutal. The, like, older, vaguely crush-esque character? Danielle hadn't even dyed her hair blue yet. Devastating. But, like, perfect for the narrative. So good. But also, oh my god. Mm-hmm. After the little band scene as well, which is so wholesome. It is just the weird balance of completely devastating and so cute and cosy. Yeah. Like, I want to call this cosy fantasy, but that's just incorrect because there's too much death. There's murder in many of our favourite cosy fantasies. Yeah, but I feel like the ensuing war between the witches and the humans is a little bit too intense. Like, it's not like one person buried under some sunflowers. It's... Okay, this is cozy fantasy in the way that steven universe is cozy fantasy yeah no I, i'd agree with that because steven universe objectively at least the first couple seasons cozy fantasy and then you get oh yeah also there's genocide have fun yeah which is the same thing that's happening here it's cozy and then there's genocide and you're like oh yeah oh wow we're really gonna deal with this in a, in a kid's book okay i love it jesus christ i wonder if it had a bit of an advantage there because obviously if you're pitching something as a kid's book but it's not published yet. You might have to be quite strict about fitting into the parameters of children's book. And I appreciate that if this is 9 to 12, it's not like more intense than Percy Jackson or something, for example. But then it has the effect of like, there is actually like blood shown on page and stuff like that, which obviously non-graphic novels get to sort of dance around by not having images. But because this was like a phenomenon on the internet first, a publisher is not going to be like, well, let's make changes to the story if something's already objectively successful. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. It slightly threw me because I thought that I'd be able to switch back and forth between the webtoon version and this version. Uh, and you cannot do that. Yes, I was thinking about warning you about that. And then I was like, they'll figure it out. Yeah, I, I learned. <laughs> I figured it out. The art is not the same. The words are not the same. This is definitely a distilled version. And if anyone is listening to this episode having read the Webtoon version, would highly recommend that you pick up the graphic novels as like a more polished version, even having only read the first one. They're so gorgeous. Not that the Webtoon's not gorgeous, but there's obviously like huge artist improvement here. Yes. Okay. I have to ask you, who's your favourite character? Ooh. (laughs) Okay, for the first half of the book, Mm -hmm. it was Princess Monica. The vibes of her of like mm. i'm a princess and i'm like a manic pixie dream girl because i've lived in a tower and i read romance novels and like i have a D character exactly like this did i look at her and immediately go you know what would be a great cosplay for next comic-con <gasps> i already have the wig oh my god please that'd be so cute like the goth version of her could be yes. so much fun i would do that in a hop so like aesthetics wise it's her potential wise vibes wise plot wise it's gotta be danny you see, have you seen the covers of the subsequent graphic novels? I've seen the cover of the second one. Okay, I will not say anything then. I have seen the cover of the third one somewhere, but I don't know where. I feel like if you look at it now... Spoilers. It's not spoilers, necessarily, because it's not clear, but I'm just... I'm very curious to... Actually, now I kind of just want you to look at it to see what your reaction will be. I've definitely seen it. So I will look at it now. Look at it now, because I feel like it's going to be interesting to discuss the potential direction of these characters. But I guess it's a cover, so it doesn't really count as a spoiler. That's really giving we've moved from Steven Universe to Vampire Diaries. (laughs) For those at home who cannot see the covers, we've gone from 12-year-old Danny and Dorian to young adult Danny and Dorian. Danny is like in her goth era, I want to say. In her Swamp Witch era. Yeah, because when I first glimpsed it, I was like, that's different characters. That's not the same characters. That's not Dorian and Danny. I have a feeling that the more I read this, the more I, the more feral I will go. Yeah. I think that that makes me think that you're going to get more feral over Danny and I don't (laughs) even know what's going to (laughs) happen. I'm so predictable at this point, but like... You're so correct though. I mean, Monica has such like, I would just like that vibe. Mm Mm-hmm. 
I would dress that way. I have pink hair. I see another pink hair character. I'm like, oh my God, I don't have to wear a wig for this one, maybe. Except I would because she's got really cool hair. But it's the same as Mirabelle from The Starless Sea. The vibes. No, I know exactly what you mean, though. Like the very energetic, I don't want to say like feminine vibes because gender is a social construct and blah, blah, blah. But the traits Mm. that we usually associate with that. Yes. I do have quite a hyper fixation on hyper feminine characters in narratives. I think because I don't feel that and have never felt that, I find characters who are that very interesting because I'm like, ooh, let me take you apart and see how you work. And that's why I like playing that in D as well, because I like exploring that aspect because it's not something that I connect to personally. Yeah, I feel that. Like, especially when they get to be interesting around characters, because at least, I mean, speaking for me here, I feel like the hyper-feminine character when we were young was usually just sort of villainized in one way or another. She was usually mm-hmm. just like the popular girl in pink being mean, or she, she was kind of put in odds with another female character who was like less traditionally feminine, but still feminine in the ways that she would still shave her legs mm. and her underarms, but like she Gust. could fix the car so she was cool. Yeah. Kind of thing. And I just, I also really like seeing those characters. Yeah. Yeah. But Danny. But Danny, she's so, yeah, I'm never going to do magic again. I don't want to hurt anybody. And then she's like, oh, actually, maybe violence is the answer. And she's so real for that. And I love her so much. And she's mm. so OP without even trying, but it's like a good kind of OP and it feels earned because she's been struggling with it throughout the entire book because it's like she's powerful but not in the way that she wants to be and not in a way that is helpful for real life and then as soon as it is helpful exactly it's very very helpful it's like if you've ever watched the hello future me videos on writing and especially they have a video on writing overpowered characters and how you have to make their power conditional in order for it to feel satisfying that really is done so effortlessly in hicks you don't even really notice the build until you're like, oh, this mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah, exactly. It's not like you're going to be like, wait, how did Danny kill a dragon? It's like, of course Danny could kill a dragon. She also can't levitate a cup. I'm very intrigued by Dorian on the cover for mm. Volume 3. He didn't compel me very much in this book. Like, he was interesting and I enjoyed him and I enjoyed how he played off with all the other characters. I didn't gravitate towards him, which I don't really gravitate towards male characters a lot of the time anyway. And I see him now and I'm like, Hello, sir. You look interesting now. Tell me how you got here. He looks, and this is going to be like a deep cut, like one person listening will know what I'm saying. He looks like Professor Caraway from High Guardian Spice. Okay. Which I haven't even seen, by the way. But he looks like that, which makes me think that he's going to be like a magic professor or something. I don't know. I love that he still has the wand, though. The pink wand. Yes. I'm obsessed with that. He looks to me like he's in his Jonathan Harker era. Like he's being haunted by the narrative but he cannot escape. Yeah, he's not having a good time, definitely. He's like, yeah, okay, like, I'll, like, help because you're on your girl boss journey, but... I see, that's interesting because I feel like they're at odds in Volume 3. Like, the the vibe that I got is, like, they're on opposite sides now. Ah, okay. The vibe, I don't know, because I think because they're next to each other Mm. in it, it feels like they're more situated in, like, the sort of, like, surrealness of the Volume 1 cover. So my brain is kind of like, maybe she's kind of dragging him along for the ride, and he's like, okay... (laughs) I'm only here to make sure you don't go completely over the moral edge. If he's going to go down that route, I'm like, Dorian, let her go over the moral edge. She's tired of being nice. Support women's wrongs, Dorian. Come on. Exactly. Support women's wrongs. You're the one who started this whole thing by picking up a dragon egg for no apparent reason. Yeah, he was just like, I want to touch it. You directly, you started the engine of this story. You got to commit to the bit. Well, I mean, in contrast to you, I think Dorian was my favourite mm-hmm. in Volume 1. Tell me more. He loves his little magical creatures, and he just wants to have friends so bad. Mm. And his character design is so cute. I feel like it's simple reasons. And to be fair, he also gets to have a slightly unhinged moment where he's protecting Danny because yes. he's unconscious. And I do love that. I'm a sucker for that. I also like that he's younger than her, but he's still the heir because Damien's gone nowhere, and I guess which is the sexist. Or is it because he's better at magic? I don't know. Um. But either way. When he had that moment, I was like, oh, you're getting interesting now. Can we have more of this? Mm. And then Monica came in and was like, no, don't do that. (laughs) You're better than this. I was like, come on, Monica. (laughs) Let him have his moment. Let him cook. I feel like if he'd been able to go over the edge, then if they do end up on alternate sides, if he'd been allowed to cook in that moment, he would have gone over the edge too. Maybe. 
To be fair, I do also find his relationship with Monica surprisingly cute. I'm usually a bit like, do the boy girlfriends in a friendship group have to get together? And I guess there is kind of an element of that here where there's like romantic feelings between pretty much every possible permutation of this group that is heterosexual, which which is... (laughs) Yeah, but like it's cute because it's messy and it doesn't actually get in the way of their friendship a lot. Mm. Like there's no like fighting over it in an irritating way. Like Nico is occasionally jealous of Mark because of Danny's attention on Mark, but it doesn't seem like Mark is seriously interested in Danny in any way. Mm. It's interesting to see the Monica Dorian dynamic and parallel it to Mm. a lot of other things. For example, Katara and Aang, which have the exact same ages. So they get together romantically, yeah. which has always been weird. I feel like Dorian is almost 13, and therefore Monica's 14, so it's like, you're basically a year apart, I'm assuming. And also you haven't pretended to be his mom. Yeah, no, this is true. <laughs> like, I feel like they feel very much on the same level, maturity-wise, mm. and I don't feel like they're about to get together any moment, even if they have like a little mutual crush going on. Yeah. It's definitely better. It's a lot better yeah. than Katara and Aang, which, in which they literally have a whole episode where they go, wow, I see him like a child. She's been mothering yeah. me. And then he goes, yeah, but we should still get together though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. Like the Katang thing, I think is just the way that their relationship has been coded since the beginning with Katara being like a caretaker. And it doesn't feel equal, whereas here it's like, oh, okay, you look out for each other, you have each other's backs. Like it feels... <laughs> more normal in that respect yeah i just don't see why it's necessary to make them 12 and 14 yeah i don't know my brain was reading everybody as queer the whole time every time they everybody talked i was like wow that's a that's a gay thing to say to be fair i feel like dorian has a crush on like every boy that he sees as well because he's just like wow he's so cool dorian and nico were giving me such vibes yes that's true i could see them being like rivals to lovers i could see that I, I can also see that, yeah. I think Ace Monica should live in my heart very strongly. That would be cute, honestly. She's like, yeah. wow, this is what I want because I've read about it in books so much. Mm. I love reading about romance. And then a man comes up to her and she's like, oh, no, <laughs> that's not it. She's already ruled out Will romantically when she decides she only likes Will, which is an interesting <laughs> little double think there. She's like, hmm, yeah, there's no way that this could work. And therefore, I want to marry you. And it's like, mm. okay. Okay, Monica. Interesting. But at least we have Will and Damien in the background to be like, definitely queer. Oh because <laughs> that's why Damien is the way that he is, really. It's just that he's like the oldest gay kid. It's that thing. <laughs> it's like, no one can understand me. And then both of his siblings are like, yeah, I've been bisexual this whole time. <laughs> As somebody with younger siblings, I can I can talk to this experience being like, oh. No one can understand me. I'm the only queer person in this family. And then everyone turns around and is like, she thought. I have an important question about Damien. Okay. And his queer rebellion. Did he dye his hair or did something <laughs> I happen? I feel like maybe he has trauma anime hair. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Is it because of his parents? Yeah, probably. I mean, okay. I did not understand why he kept showing up until he's revealed uh, as their sibling. I was like, why are you living yeah. in the palace? Why do I care about you? I don't understand where you've come from. None of these questions are particularly answered in the narrative. He just lives in the palace. He lives in the palace for inexplicable reasons. Monica's like, yeah, he lives in the palace. I don't even know if she says that he's a witch because she freaks out when she finds out that Danny and Dorian are witches. So I'm not sure that she knew that Damon was a witch. But the king obviously knows that Damon's a witch because he's like, I trust you completely. Go do your witchy business for me and also look for my daughter. So like, he knows. Like, why is he there? (laughs) Did she run away and join the king? He ran away. We know that much. But yeah, yeah. How did he end up in the palace? Why does anybody trust him? How did he end up BFF slash romantic interests with Will? And he's been there since he was like kind of young ish. Mm. In flashbacks, where Monica's younger and Will is younger, he's younger too and he's hanging around. So he was like, he looks like he was Danny and Dorian's age. Mm in the palace so what happened there i feel like he's got a darker backstory than them in terms of i feel like it happened when he was younger Mm. that he figured out that his parents were i feel like we've got to dig into it at some point no surely they've done all this setup for damien and he's so intriguing and i bet he was a fan favorite for the web too oh yeah the aesthetics the vibes the aesthetics alone the panel where he has the crown on and it's like dripping black ichor into his hair oh my god beautiful show-stopping spectacular but he still has the blue eyes, so is, is is it him? Probably not. You know, I want it to be Danny. I want that for her. Can we talk about the fashion in general? I know we've already said about Monica, 
but I just love everyone's outfits. I love Danny's outfits when she starts wearing colour. Mm. I love Dorian and Danny's matching outfits. All of the outfit designs are so, so cute. Yeah. The suspenders, the vibes, they're adorable. I love them. Also, just the detail of backgrounds. Yes. Where, especially when I was first reading it, I was like, wow, I don't care about the characters. Show me the house. Like the first page, the detail on the street is insane. Mm. The way it bends like it's in a fisheye lens. Mm. Adds to the whimsical kind of vibe. It's very cute. It's so cool. That was another thing that I really enjoyed on rereading was just seeing all of these little things that I had missed in panels because I was too invested in the story. Cat clinging to the broom on page five. The scene where Monica is apologizing to Dorian on page 259. Cat and Carlos are like peeking over the mattress and it's the cutest thing in the world. Also them both getting startled when she comes in. And I shudder to think how long this took in general. Yeah, it's so long. So good. I love the really thick line art and the brushes that she uses. Yeah. I love the colour coding of the speech bubbles and like when the twins talk at the same time and the bubbles like half blue, half pink. That's so cute. I've got to give a shout out to Will because I did not connect him to being the prince at first because like him when he can't talk and he's like just tied up, he looks like the most glowering like YA protagonist and then we actually (laughs) meet him in Monica's memories he's the klutziest like vibiest guy who's just out here being a silly little man that scene where she's like running him through all of those questions and he's answering them and then she's like amazing you didn't get any of them right (laughs) (laughs) characterization is so thorough in Mm. sort of perceptions of characters in that like they have whole interior lives going on and motivations and like how they're perceived by different characters changes a little bit like the way they exist on the page. Yeah. And it's so cool. It's so good. Yeah. Everyone has misconceptions about everyone, which sounds like it would be a miscommunication nightmare, but it's just reality. Also, action scenes, fight scenes, always feel like I knew what was going on. Mm. Dynamic. Some really fun paneling, not even just in fight scenes, but just in like normal conversation scenes. The scene right after Nico first gets shrunk where they're walking through the woods comes to mind and they're kind of sliding around the swamp. There's just some very fun angles. And I'm going to be slightly mean and say that sometimes with webtoons, I feel like people go very simple with dialogue and things. And they're just like, let me just draw this so that I can get it out kind of thing. Mm. Whereas I feel like here, the creative decision is consistently made, even if it will be a lot more difficult. Yeah very dialogue heavy but i really like it surprisingly so i think it works still very readable still very understandable i feel like the dialogue also has a very natural cadence and people have good voices like even without color coding i bet the majority of the time you could tell who was talking even if you didn't have a tail leading to the person yeah i do love that it can be really creepy at points like when monica climbs up into the rapunzel tower and it's like this weird dead-eyed doll Mm. what's going on there I'm scared. I thought it was supposed to be like a ghost version of her. Ah. It was so innovative, though, to have like, oh, yeah, you can climb up Rapunzel's hair. She's not real, though. How are you going to get down? And I do love the the broom scene right after that. Yeah. I love the just like lampshading of a bunch of different like fairy tales. I love that Monica is the party cleric. I love that she's like, are you serious? You didn't think to learn healing magic? (laughs) Yeah. Of all the things, that wasn't day one. She's the archetypal reluctant healer. She's truly like, I just want to use inflict wounds, but I have to use cure wounds instead. God damn it. Monica is complaining loudly at the Dungeons and Dragons table every time her turn comes up and she has to spend it healing whatever the rest of the party just did when she was about spiritual weapon and behead something. Mm. I feel like she actually surprisingly almost has like the strongest moral core, which is quite fun because I feel like with the archetypal like spoiled character, often... They can just, again, like, default to me. And even, like, her ladies in waiting, like, she cares about them a lot. Mm. She's really excited to see them again when she reunites with them. And then she's very, very distressed when she has to rescue them. She's the most willing to change. Mm. And she's constantly having her, like, perceptions, like, challenge. But she very regularly is like, okay, yeah, I've learned now. Yeah. Cool. I'm happy to take on this knowledge and change accordingly. Mm. And she's so trusting, just by the fact that like lots of shit happens. She's like, "Yeah, I'll come live with this stranger in this house," just by the fact that he's cursed all my guards so that they don't remember being here. This is a great <laughs> idea. It's fine. I love that for her. She has a bodyguard with her. It's fine. The bodyguard being Nico, obviously. Yes. 
I also love that the master's plan is to just murder these children. Like, it's so dark. Like, you'd think that maybe they would hedge it and be like, oh, he's just gonna lock them in a basement forever so that there's no chance that they can become the Witch King. But he's like, no, I'm just gonna kill them. And he's not even like, oh, I know which one it is, and therefore I'll kill that one. He's like, I don't know, so I'm just gonna kill both. (laughs) To yes. be safe. It's such an insane plan. Like, it's literally the first moment you meet him, like, with that cup of tea. They could have been dead from day one. He's trying to poison them. I love that they're like, yes, hot chocolate. This hot chocolate tastes really watery and leafy, almost like tea. That's so cute. Oh, I love the king. I love mm. the plot twist with the king. That he's, like, genuinely actually trying to, like, broker peace. That yeah. was really nice. I think it could have been very like straightforward, typical, exactly what you expect. Like, yeah, exactly. He's actually secretly hated witches, and he was tricking you here all along. It's like, no, he genuinely just wants peace, and he's like, we're all humans. Can we? Can we be nice to each other? We've lost too many things, and also, you've been good friends to my daughter. Do you want to live in my palace? Yeah, kind of an icon. I kind of love that for him. He's a frog now. He's a frog now. Which I thought was also an interesting, because everyone thinks that he's dead. Because you get that panel later where everyone's like, oh my god, the king's dead. It's like, no, he's just a frog. He's fine. I mean, he's not fine. So Monica's going to have to be a queen now. Oh boy. Oh my god, I didn't even think that. That's not going to go well. <laughs> She's going to get so traumatised. Love that for her. All this responsibility on everybody. The scene where Danny nearly gets burned alive, the hug afterwards. It's just important to me. <laughs> this this is like the equivalent of me doing quotes and just saying the weight of that hug. Yeah. And she's just like bawling because she's just a little kid and she nearly just got burned at the bloody stake. Yeah. The way everyone is so soft with her after that, like just in that scene. And Mark's like, oh, I'm going to have to give her a hug. And she's like, I do not give a damn about your existence right now. And I just want my brother. Yeah. Cute. I don't have the time to read this book next, but I want to. Before we do final thoughts, I'll just say that I would read like so many chilled out slice of life comics about these people just like mm. vibing having little adventures making potions at the beach yeah and oh, you get a little bit of that at the end which i really like it's interesting because i was wondering how they decided to split up the volumes because presumably it was just chapter by chapter as a webtoon and i don't know if there were hiatuses and things that have now sort of taken the place of the volume breaks but it's an interesting feeling that i feel like i usually only get with manga where Things are just sort of happening. Mm. And there are obviously overarching arcs, but the way that the volume ends is a bit like, wait, wait, keep going. I don't know. I felt like that was quite a solid climax to the book. No, I do feel like it was a solid climax, but I also just feel like it wouldn't have been like that if it was planned. You know what I mean? Not in a bad way at all. Yeah. I feel like if something is so long running, you kind of have to plan it in arcs. Oh yeah, no, definitely. I feel like there's almost like three climaxes in this in that there's like Danny nearly dying and then there's the floating rock situation and the reveal that Ken Dragons is just going to murder these children possibly and then the palace climax. Yeah, I feel like it's it's a good place to end it though. Yeah, no, I'm not saying it's a bad place to end it, but I'm just saying like if you were like, give me a three-act structure for this one volume novel, we'd be like, no, Mm -hmm. I can give you like three three three-act structures. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's why it's a volume. Morgan, you're the new reader of Hookie. What are your final thoughts on this book? It was really good. I would read this again. I would read the sequel. I would make everybody else I know read it. I literally hopped into the Hidden Bookcase Discord and like started ranting about it in the like spoiler tags. Oh, is that what you were talking about? Because you were like, Soren, don't look at this. It was literally just me being like, what the f*** is in this book? I'm going feral. When I came up to my co-workers with the second book, I was like, oh my god, I finished this last night. You guys have to read it. It's so good. I love this book. I love everything about it. It was written for me specifically. It was. It has every single one of my favourite tropes. It also has the thing that you were talking about on some recent episodes, which I was feeling very smug about what editing them which is that it's second world fantasy but it has cars and phones and technology mm, i do like that it might end up being in my top 10 quite possibly Ooh, which is a very high honor for listeners i'm gonna give you a sneak peek the top 10 is gonna be a lot harder to decide this year what's your current count for listeners we're recording this in early november so morgan has two more months to go feral 321 How many days have there been in this year so far? Not that many! 312. So you've read 10 more books than there are days of the year. How am I supposed to pick my top 10? Soren, how did it feel rereading this book? What are your final thoughts? 
this was so much fun. If anything, I liked it more on a reread. Uh, maybe I was just so exhausted on the initial read that I was like, yeah, this is, I feel like this is really good and that Morgan would really like it. And then I read it when I was awake and I was like, oh, this is actually like really good. Yeah. I love it. I love the art style. I love the writing. I love the dialogue. I love the plot. I love the tropes involved. I love Dorian and Danny and I love their twin vibes. And I love the fact that they make me feel like I'm watching Gravity Falls again for the first time or watching The Owl House for the first time. Or watching a Ghibli movie. I think this is a five star for me and I'm very excited to see what happens next and I love them. I, sh- I should say this is a five star for me as well. There's something about sibling dynamics in like quirky fantasy kids mm. media that just hits so different. You've got actual siblings so I feel like you're a better place to explain it than me. Yeah me and my siblings would not go on quirky fantasy adventures together. We would kill each other within five minutes. Morgan, for people who loved Hooky Volume 1, what would you recommend that they read next? I mean, we've discussed A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik, and I'm definitely going to recommend that because I think the magic vibes make similar sense. The sort of like weird balance between like funny and horrifying is well struck, I think, as well. Because it does read like a YA novel, and then the narrator is out here being like, yeah, I'm incredibly autistic coded anyway but then also you've got the absolutely horrifying bits of like yeah it's regular for like a quarter of the class to survive to graduation yeah i tried to clean my room and i came up with a few murder spells by accident it's beautiful i really really love it um so i would recommend that i like gravity falls yeah i was gonna say if you want if you want more twins and they have a similar-ish dynamic in that it's like the slightly uptight bookish boy and the more gregacious girl. But um, Daddy's not as unhinged as Mabel is, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like these two have slightly too much repression to be mm. like the Pine Swins. Yeah, that's what Whereas it is. those two grew up in the USA, therefore they get a little <laughs> extra unhingedness for Spice. Exactly. Mm. Also, if you like frogs, Amphibia. Yeah, I feel like that has that really similar vibe of this like colourful, whimsical world that seems so fun and cute. And then it's like, have some grief. And you're like, oh my god. <laughs> like, have some really serious themes explored in a really emotional way. Yeah. Have the destruction of places and mm. like all these like legacies of colonialism. Have fun. And you're like, thank you. Okay. I'm devastated. Similarly, if you want more queer witches, I have to say the Owl House. I know we briefly mentioned it. Mm. But it's right there. We're going for cartoons today. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's just the vibe of Hooky. Like, it feels like it should be a cartoon, and therefore we're mm. recommending a bunch of cartoons. If you like the colour and, like, the background vibes and the overarching narrative plot, Finding Home, which we've previously done an episode on, and is mm. also available on Webtoon. And it's finished now, unlike when we first did it. <laughs> I'm also going to recommend Cardcaptor Sakura by Clamp, mm. with the caveat that it is dated and that it involves some weird age gap relationships because Clamp were very much like, love is love, including a teacher with a student. And that's gross, so we don't like that. But what we do like is that they had queer representation. So just go in with your eyes open, knowing that's going to happen. But I feel like this does take quite a lot of influence from like the magical girl genre and from like shoujo manga in general, but obviously also from like shonen, because it's a blend. It's a nice blend. Cardcaptor Sakura is very much like a trope definer, and it's very fun, and it's got lots of cute outfits if you enjoyed that aspect of Hookie. And it's just got coming-of-age vibes and kids dealing with the fact that they're magic. And specifically, if you liked the whole rivals to crushes vibe of Dorian and Monica, that's basically the dynamic between Sakura and Sior and Lee. And also, if you like the whole crush on someone older who is definitely just gay for his best friend trope because you think it's funny, that also happens <laughs> in Cock After Sakura. So that's there too. And then also for webtoons, if you want more whimsical fantasy vibes that are kind of slice of life and then a little bit of plot kicks in, and if you want it to be extremely homosexual, High Class Homos by Memo Ziri. It's really fun. It's about a princess and a prince who, they're in a lavender engagement. They're not married yet, but they are both queer. The prince has a whole thing with his knight and he's having a great time. And the princess is having a lot more of a messy sapphic time. She's got exes and she's got crushes and it's it's a whole situation. But they're best friends, lots of like silly little comedy of errors type shenanigans. And it's also like a very cute sort of colourful pastel vibe. And it's good fun. And also the princess is an amputee. That's very cool. 
which I think is quite cool. She uses prostatic and it's just like a fun bit of disability rap. I find it hilarious that it's called High Class Homos because it makes it almost impossible to recommend to anybody because you have the same phrase, <laughs> High Class Homos. <laughs> it's actually really good. Mm-hmm. And it is not finished, finished, but there is a whole season of it out. So there's like over 100 episodes you can get stuck in. Our next episode will be our 2023 wrap up. This is horrifying. Our 2023 yep. reading wrap up where we will talk about the books that we read this year, the staggering number of them in Morgan's case, <laughs> what we want to read in 2024, what like our anticipated releases are, what we hope to read if we want to read around in some new genres or read more of a certain demographic of author, that kind of thing. So and what if I finish a book at a New Year's Eve party? What if I'm a boring person who will read a book at a New Year's party and then I have to be like, I lied. On the hidden bookcase. You won't have lied for because posterity. It, you'll <laughs> we'll see where we're at closer to the time. It could be that you'll have just finished a bunch of things and you'll be starting a long book and you'll be like, well, there's no way I'll finish this by the end of the year. Yeah. Maybe I'll deliberately do that. If you want. I'm not that concerned. Slow myself down. As soon as I get to 365, I'll find every book over 500 pages and start them all at once. Our reading wrap-up for 2023 will be out on January the 15th. Three days before my birthday. Three days before Morgan's birthday. <laughs> Until then, you're always welcome through the bookcase. Don't forget to scratch the cat on your way out. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Bookcase, a production of Planar Prod. On this episode, you heard Morgan Greensmith and Soren Brywood discussing Hookie by Miriam Banastre Tur. You can find out more about this book on Tur's author page on HarperCollins.com, and you can follow Tur on Instagram at Miriam Banastre. You can find The Hidden Bookcase on Twitter at Hidden Bookcase, and on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, and TikTok at Hidden Bookcase Podcast. Find out more about Planar Prod at PlanarProd.com. Know what we should read next, or want to chat to us about what you thought of this episode's read? You can reach us at thehiddenbookcase at gmail.com, send us a DM on social media, or come chat with your fellow bookworms in our growing Discord server. The link is in the show notes. Want to support The Hidden Bookcase? You can support us on Patreon for bonus episodes every month, outtakes, playlists, and other extras via bookthroughourbookshop.org page linked in the show notes, or consider leaving us a rating or a review, or telling a friend how to find us. Your whispers are the best way for bookworms to discover our show. Our next episode will be our 2023 reading wrapper, and will be out on the 15th of January. Thanks so much for being along with us for our first full year of reading at The Hidden Bookcase. We've had so much fun reading with all of you bookworms new and old, and we wish you nothing short of a truly magical 2024.